the hotel era. When we stroll through the beautiful conifer forests at the summit, it's hard to imagine that Little Mountain was the site of a bustling summer resort for 94 years from 1831 to 1925. The resort included structures and amenities such as large hotels, summer cottages, livery stable, bowling alley, billiard hall, church steam laundry, general store, Western Union Telegraph, a post office, general store, and a church. Virtually every trace of this community has vanished, having been dismantled board by board and removed from the mountaintop. The hotel era began in 1831 with the construction of the Little Mountain House by the 300-pound fiddle-playing veteran of the War of 1812, Captain Simeon Reynolds. In 1868, the structure was upgraded and enlarged by Charles A. Avery into a three-story structure overlooking Lake Erie from the northwest rim of Little Mountain. Twenty vacation cottages were added to the hotel property. Rates were $2.50 per day or $10 to $14 per week. The hotel could accommodate 300 guests and included a ballroom, observation platform, and a social hall. The Little Mountain Eagle began life in 1853 as the short-lived water cure, the brainchild of two local doctors, but one that never lived up to financial expectations. In 1855, the boarding house was enlarged into a 40-room, two- and three-story luxury hotel with a large observatory on top. Advertisements touted the wild and romantic scenery, cool breezes, pure water, fragrant pines, and the fact that no pain or expense would be spared to make a stay there the highest degree pleasant for its guests. Never a huge success nor as popular as the other hotels, it fell into ruin and was torn down in 1892. The Pinecrest Hotel was in its day an impressive ultramodern facility built to replace the long-running but eventually unprofitable Lakeview House dismantled to make room for the Pinecrest. The new hotel was three stories tall and had a large veranda, a circular drive, terraces, tennis courts, new stables, shooting gallery, casino, and a playhouse for children. It boasted the most modern facilities and conveniences, including electricity, hot and cold running water, gas heat, fire alarm, fire plugs and hoses, speaking tubes, electric call bell system, and a baggage elevator. Daily rates were $2.50 to $3.50 per day, far beyond the reach of the average Ohioan, but well within the means of the wealthy clientele from a growing and economically booming Cleveland. It lasted until 1904, a victim of the greater convenience and increased range of the automobile, an invention that put more spectacular tourist destinations like Niagara Falls within reach. The Pinecrest fell into ruin and was torn down in 1925. It's hard for a modern-day person to imagine a two-week vacation spent relaxing in a rocking chair on a hotel porch. The workaday lives of our ancestors were far less hectic than ours, and judging from this old photo, so were their vacations. These ladies aren't even trying to get a suntan. What Little Mountain offered, to those who could afford it, was relief from the stifling heat and polluted conditions of downtown Cleveland before the advent of air conditioning. In this undated photo from the turn of the century, a group of men and women commemorate the moment by posing for a photo in front of the Pinecrest Hotel. No cut-off jeans or flip-flops here. These folks are dressed in their finest even while on vacation at a summer resort. Hotel advertisements stress the cool nights, low humidity, lake breezes, cool daytime temperatures, balsamic odor of the pines, refreshing spring waters, and complete rest available on top of the mountain. This undated photo shows a group of Little Mountain vacationers dressed in their finest, enjoying a rustic picnic. The number on the picnic basket in the foreground suggests that one of the hotels may have packed it. Renting or owning a summer cottage was another way to enjoy Little Mountain. The Lakeview House had 20 cottages built near the hotel. A number of wealthy Clevelanders bought land to build their own cottages. 
According to enthusiastically written advertising brochures of the time, there were allegedly no gnats, flies, or mosquitoes on Little Mountain. Healing waters provided relief from hay fever, malaria, and insomnia. Then there was the view of Lake Erie and interesting caves and crevasses to explore. This undated photo taken at the Lakeview House was found in the archives of the Lake County Historical Society and used with their permission. The photo was taken sometime between 1867 and 1891. It's not clear what's going on here, but whiskey was rumored to be a beverage of choice at Little Mountain events. One can't help but wonder whatever happened to this costume. Photos taken at Little Mountain from this period often depict men dressed in suits and wearing tall silk hats. Ladies rarely ventured out without hats and parasols. People dressed according to their station in life, and a suntan face was viewed as a mark of coarseness and poverty, belonging to someone of little education, such as a farmer or field hand, who has spent his life working outdoors. Among the most famous vacationers at Little Mountain was John D. Rockefeller, who lived from 1839 to 1937. He was perhaps America's greatest industrialist, investor, and philanthropist of all times. He was the world's first oil tycoon, the world's first billionaire, and in current dollars, the richest man in history. As a philanthropist, he funded the research that led to the cure for hookworm, which was the scourge of the American South, and for yellow fever, which was the scourge of the tropics. He also helped fund some of the most prestigious educational institutions of the United States, including Johns Hopkins University and the University of Chicago. James A. Garfield served briefly as the 20th President of the United States, arising from what some say was the most impoverished background of any person who has ever reached the presidency. Born at Moreland Hills in 1831, he was the last of the log cabin presidents. He worked as a mule skinner, janitor, carpenter, and part-time teacher before passing the Ohio bar exam. He was entirely self-taught in the law. He later served as professor of classics at Hiram College. He rose to major general during the Civil War, having fought at Shiloh and Chickamauga, and then resigned his commission to enter politics at the urging of President Abraham Lincoln. Garfield was a lifelong champion of emancipation, a foe of political corruption and initiated steps that outlawed patronage and nepotism in government appointments. After serving only 200 days as president, he was assassinated by a deranged office seeker in 1881. Jephthah Homer Wade was born in 1811 and died in 1890. He was a famous Cleveland industrialist, banker, and philanthropist. An early photographer and portrait painter, he became fascinated with the possibilities of the telegraph for rapid communication. One of the founders of Western Union Telegraph, he completed the linkage between the U.S. East Coast and the West Coast, making him a communications giant of, the, of his day. He donated the land that eventually became Wade Park and Wade Oval at University Circle. A staunch advocate of educational opportunities for Northeast Ohioans, he was the founder of Hathaway Brown School and Case University. Amasa Stone was one of Cleveland's wealthiest men, a construction contractor, steel manufacturer, railroad builder, financier, and philanthropist. He was a major benefactor of Western Reserve University, which later became part of Case Western Reserve University. He held a patent for a revolutionary type of steel truss railroad bridge that was faster and cheaper to build. Ignoring the advice of engineers, he built one near Ashtabula with an overly long span. It collapsed into a deep snow-filled ravine late at night when the first train tried to cross over it. To make matters worse, it was a passenger train. The wreck killed 92 passengers, earning the name Ashtabula Horror. Two years later, Amasa Stone committed suicide after a board of inquiry found him partially responsible for the collapse. The accident instigated a tightening of safety standards for railroad bridges throughout the United States. In 1893, the Church of the Transfiguration was built on half an acre of land purchased for one dollar from the Little Mountain Club, a group of prominent Cleveland businessmen invested in Little Mountain property. The club also donated the bell, the altar, and some of the stained glass windows which were manufactured in Munich, Germany.
By then, the nearby Little Mountain Eagle Hotel had fallen into ruin. Lumber and stone from its demolition were recycled to build the Episcopal Church depicted in this drawing. Near the end of the summit trail, we arrive at the only monument dedicated to any of the many structures that once stood on Little Mountain. It commemorates and stands on the site of the former Church of the Transfiguration. The bronze plaque describes the 119-year history of the church as it moved from location to location in Lake County. This is a picture of the commemoration plaque for the church. As you read it, see if you can spot a mathematical error now cast in bronze for all time. In June 1983, this plaque was installed on the Little Mountain Stone Monument. It commemorates the first centennial of the Church of the Transfiguration, which stood on this site from 1893 to 1916 when the church was moved to Salida Beach at Mentor on the Lake. There it stood for 33 years until 1929, according to the inscription, when the building was moved to its current location on Baldwin Road. This is where the math goes awry because 1916 plus 33 years would mean that the church wasn't moved from Mentor on the Lake until 1949. This is the Church of the Transfiguration, renamed St. Hubert's Episcopal Church as it appears today on Baldwin Road. It was moved here on June 2, 1929 from its former location at Salida Beach, Mentor on the Lake, where it stood for 13 years from 1916 to 1929, as opposed to the 33 years cast in bronze in the Little Mountain Commemorative Monument. The church now sits in a beautiful natural setting on the banks of the East Branch Chagrin River. The original structural framework, the stained glass windows, and the church bell all survived both building moves. Almost every trace of the hotel era has disappeared. One of the few exceptions is the old pump house. Built in the bottom of a deep crevasse at the edge of the outcrop, it taps a cave-like opening leading a short distance into the conglomerate outcrop on the right, half filled with groundwater. The spring water was tapped and pumped into a cistern to provide running water, a modern, luxurious convenience for that time for the Lakeview Hotel. Cheryl Barabane found this fascinating antique half buried in soil and leaf litter near the Little Mountain Trail in 2010. She was on a tour led by her husband, Tony, who took this photo after cleaning the bottle. Mexican Mustang liniment was one of the most popular and widely used patent medicines of the 1800s. First introduced in 1825, it was advertised as a cure for lameness, sore throats, burn sprains, insect bites, animal bites, rheumatism, common colds, and a variety of other ailments in adults, children, and domestic animals, including cats, dogs, and horses. The active ingredients were one-third crude oil, which is the petroleum we refine today to make gasoline, one-third olive oil, and one-third ammonium carbonate, which is used in smelling salts and as a leavening agent in baked goods before the advent of baking powder. How these ingredients work together to cure so many ailments is anyone's guess, but people in those days swore by it. The contents of this bottle may have been used by a vacationer to soothe sore muscles following a day of exploring the outcrops on Little Mountain. We occasionally find miscellaneous bits and pieces of cast iron fixtures on the hilltop and near the base of the outcrop, especially along the southern edge of the trail route. Old maps dating from the late 1800s show at least 52 buildings on top of Little Mountain, aligned mostly along the northwestern crest of the hilltop, which offers a distant view of Lake Erie. Given how many structures have fallen into ruin or been demolished, it's surprising how little debris we find on the mountain. It appears our forebearers recycle lumber and metals much more efficiently than we do today. If we look two-thirds of the way up on the eastern hemlock trunk pictured here on the right side of the photo, we see a metal bracket with two antique electrical insulators nailed to the tree. It is another tiny remnant of what was once a fashionable resort with all the modern conveniences. The builders used living trees to support electrical transmission and telegraph lines that powered the hotels. Other luxuries included hot and cold running water, indoor plumbing, electrical call bell system, and baggage elevators. It was a common diversion in those days to scratch your name and the date in all sorts of unusual or hard to reach places. It was a way of announcing to posterity your vis visits to the high sandstone cliffs in Stebbins Gulch, or the tops of the 100 plus foot high eastern hemlocks on Little Mountain, or the walls of Devil's Kitchen. Several examples in Devil's Kitchen are pictured here. Most of the dates are from the late 1800s. 
Many are now obscured by satanic symbols spray-painted or smoked on the walls by trespassing vandals in the recent past. There's a story that wealthy hotel patrons, not keen on mudding their boots in Devil's Kitchen, sent their servants to do the carving on their behalf.